now I would like to introduce the 28 members of the new Executive Council and the seven newly elected AFL-CIO delegates who I will be installing tonight. I'm going to invite our AFL delegates to the stage. Anita Guzik, who is from Branch 24, Los Angeles, California. She is an incumbent AFL-CIO delegate and has served us for many, many years in that capacity. Lloyd Doucette from Branch 124 in New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> Lloyd is also an incumbent trustee who has been reelected. He's not here? Okay, never mind, Lloyd. Standing in for Lloyd is no one. Elise Foster, Branch 11, Chicago, <laughs> Illinois. who is also a re-elected AFL-CIO delegate. <laughs> Michael O'Neill, Branch 38, New Jersey merged, who is a newly elected AFL-CIO delegate. Where are you, Mike? Here you are. Run, Mike, run. Michael Willitson, Branch 86, Hartford, Connecticut, is also a newly elected AFL-CIO delegate. Mike retired from his presidency of Hartford, where he was president for what, 30, 34 years? 34 years. Yeah. Paul Rossi, Branch 84, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, also a new AFL CIO delegate. And Judy Quillam, Branch 650, Great Falls, Montana, who is also the state president of Montana. <laughs> Next, I want to introduce our National Trustees. How do you pronounce that? Larry? Yeah. Larry's the only one in the council who's been here longer than me. Larry Brown, who is the chairman of the trustees, Branch 24, Los Angeles, California. Re-elected, Larry also started with President James Wood. Sandra Lamell, Branch 1, Detroit, Michigan. Sandy is an incumbent who was appointed during this past term and is now newly elected. What do you think of the music? The And Charlie Heege, Branch 36, New York, New York, a newly elected national trustee. Okay, now I'm honored to call our 15 national business agents.
Now, let me just announce them. That'd be easier. That's so funny. <laughs> Bruce Didrickson, our newly elected national business agent in Region 15. Rick DeCheca, Region 14, re-elected national business agent. Veda Preston, re-elected national business agent, Region 13. Brian Thompson, re-elected national business agent, Region 12. <laughs> Mark Camilli, re-elected national business agent, Region 11. Newly elected in Region 10, National Business Agent, Sean Boyd. <laughs> Newly elected National Business Agent in Region 9, Eddie Davidson. Steve Lassen, Region 8, National Business Agent, re-elected. <laughs> Newly elected National Business Agent, Region 7, Patrick Johnson. Re-elected national business agent in Region 6, David Mudd. Region 5. National business agent, re-elected, David Teagarden. Denver Sluice, Region 4, National Business Agent, re-elected. <laughs> 
Region 3, re-elected national business agent, Mike Kariff. And in Region 2, re-elected national business agent, Nick Vafiades. And newly elected in Region 1 National Business Agent, Keisha Lewis. Want to do some more? Okay, I am now to announce the national resident officers to the stage. First, Stephanie Stewart, Director of the Health Benefit Plan, re-elected. Jim Yates, re-elected Director of Life Insurance. Dan Choth, re-elected Director of Retired Members. Manuel Peralta, Jr., re-elected Director of Safety and Health. Chris Jackson, re-elected Director of City Delivery. Newly elected <clears throat> Assistant Secretary Treasurer Mac Julian. National Secretary Treasurer, Nicole Ryan. An appointed incumbent and newly elected to the office of Vice President, James Henry.
and your incumbent Assistant Secretary Treasurer, who has been reelected as your Executive Vice President, Paul Barner. And finally, last but not least, your incumbent Executive Vice President, who has been reelected as the 19th President of the NELC, Brian L. Renfro. Okay. I'm still president. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, these are the officers and delegates whom you have elected. If any brother or sister has any valid objection to the installation of these members, let him or her now speak or forever after hold his or her peace. Your time is up. <laughs> Wouldn't be able to see anyway. <laughs> Do you, each and every one of you, accept the office to which you have been elected? Yeah, yeah right. Okay, two things. I would ask you each to please raise your right hand and repeat after me the following obligation. I do solemnly promise on my honor that I will observe and faithfully execute The laws of the National Association of Letter Carriers. I will perform to the best of my ability the duties of the office to which I have been elected, guard all property placed in my charge, and at the expiration of my term of office, Turn the same over to my successor. I will do all in my power to promote the welfare of the National Association of Letter Carriers and its members. You may all lower your hands and stop repeating after me because I now by the power in me vested by the National Association of Letter Carriers, do declare the officers of the National Association of Letter Carriers and the AFL-CIO delegates duly and legally installed for the length of their term of office or until their successors are elected and installed. Congratulations to all of you. Your election to the office of President of the National Association of Letter Carriers is an indication of the high esteem in which you're held by your members. Your duties are many, and chief among them is to be at all times ready to promote the welfare of the association and to enforce the laws with firmness and impartiality 
so that when the sound of the gavel, the symbol of authority, which I will present to you in a minute, when it's heard, it will be cheerfully and willingly obeyed. May you continue in the good work begun and may success crown your efforts. Congratulations and good luck over the next four years, my brother. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, brothers and sisters. Good evening. Tonight, I have a lot of people to congratulate and to thank, after which I will outline some of the serious challenges facing our union and its new executive council. But I have to tell you to start, as a native of Mississippi, I feel a little bit like a Southern minister about to give a sermon to a congregation that's already thinking about the Sunday potluck to follow. <laughs> so it's probably best that I don't go on too long tonight. There are, however, a few uh, complicating factors. This congregation has already eaten. It's Saturday night, not Sunday morning. We're in Washington, not Hattiesburg. And you're all thinking about a party with music and alcohol, not a church potluck. So I promise to do my best to keep this speech relatively short so that we can all head over to the holiday party next door and celebrate together. I'll start by offering my congratulations to all my sisters and brothers who just took the oath of office. It's a tremendous honor to be installed with each of you and to be a part of the new executive council of our great union, the National Association of Letter Carriers. We are a team. First and foremost, the members of the NALC have entrusted us with leadership of something very, very precious, their union, our union. And I know that every one of you share my commitment to work together every single day for what is in the best interest of America's 285,000 city letter carriers, active and retired alike. In addition to our newly installed national officers, I also want to congratulate and thank their families and friends, many of which are with us tonight. Union activism at any level is impossible without their love and their support. The long hours, the travel, phone calls from members at all hours of the day and night place a special burden on any union representative, but also on their families. We appreciate all of you for giving us the love and support we need to succeed. Thank you very much. I want to welcome our special guests, especially my brother, APW President Mark Demonstein, and my sister, APW Secretary Treasurer Liz Powell. It means a great deal to all of us that you took the time to attend our installation. Our unions have a long and proud history of cooperation and solidarity, a history that has made each of our unions stronger, and we all look forward to continuing our work together in the future. I would also like to thank AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler for being here as well. Um, she had quite an extensive day of travel to get here, and I'm certainly excited to continue strengthening our bonds of union solidarity with the AFL-CIO and its unions in the years to come. I also want to offer a special welcome to my family members that are here with me tonight. My sister Elizabeth Bracey and her husband Josh from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. They are here representing my mom and dad who could not be here tonight in person, though they certainly are here in spirit. It's not just that my parents brought me into this world together, for which I'm naturally grateful, but also because I probably would not have become a letter carrier 
if not for my father, Ken Renfro. He started as a letter carrier three years before I was born and is a proud retired member of my branch, NALC Branch 938 in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I'm never asking this question, but I really hope he didn't get in trouble for giving my two-year-old self a ride in his Jeep back in 1982. I grew up immersed in the issues facing letter carriers because they affected my father and my family. I saw how hard my dad worked and how important the union was to all of us. I developed a deep appreciation of the value and values from the NA of the NALC at a very early age. When I became a letter carrier in 2004, I had the pleasure of occasionally working alongside my dad in the same station for a couple of years before he retired. I got involved in the union because I wanted to help the people I worked with every day. I'm thankful I was given the opportunity to serve as a shop steward, and I'm thankful for every opportunity I've been given to serve our members since then. So on this wonderful evening, I wish to express an overwhelming sense of gratitude I feel towards my branch, Region 8, and most importantly, towards my dad and our family. Liz and Josh, thank you for being here with me tonight. Your presence makes this very special. I love you both. I have two huge mentors and friends I want to recognize tonight. First, of course, is Lou Drass, who led us in the Pledge of Allegiance earlier this evening. Ooh. I literally cannot thank Lou enough for the many opportunities he gave me to serve NALC over the years. He recognized my potential before I did and then helped me over and over to develop as an advocate, a trainer, and as a union leader. As national business agent, Lou was an endless source of creativity and innovation in his approach to representation, organizing, fundraising, fundraising for our political action fund, training, advocacy, and he mentored me all along the way. As a 20-something-year-old branch president, long late-night conversations with my national business agent about our union and my future motivated me to do all I could do to help our members, and it still does to this day. Lou's effectiveness and success led him to Washington, where he rose to the vice presidency of the NALC and became a beloved national leader. That love was evident every time he took the stage at a rap session or a convention, or as we saw earlier tonight, at an installation ceremony. So how about one more round to lose? <laughs> Thank you, Lou, for all you've done for NALC and all you've done for me. I could never repay you for everything you've taught me, but I will repay it to those you always cared about and worked so hard for, our members. Second, I want to express my love and appreciation for the 18th president of the NALC, Fred Rolando. We've had some great presidents over the history of this union, such as Bill Doherty and, of course, NALC's greatest president, Vince Sombrato. Fred Rolando belongs among those greats. Over the past 14 years, Fred has led us through recessions, three rounds of bargaining, and a pandemic with steadiness, intelligence, and sound judgment. All at a time when the Postal Service has been forced to transform itself in the face of dramatic technological change and repeated political attacks targeting postal monopoly, six-day delivery, and affordable universal service. Through it all, he mobilized all our union's resources to make the best possible case for letter carriers in bargaining and in interest arbitration while leading a broad coalition of political and legislative allies to fight back and to win. He leaves office with our union stronger than ever, financially, politically, and organizationally. For me personally, Fred has been an excellent mentor. In 2013, when I worked for him as an executive assistant to the president, he told me, you may have to do this job one day. In the nearly 10 years since, he's prepared me for my new responsibilities by giving me the opportunity 
to serve as chief spokesperson in two rounds of bargaining, work with our management counterparts at USPS headquarters on a daily basis to help our members and oversee our organizing and political and legislative affairs efforts. Fred's work ethic and integrity are an inspiration to me and all the incoming members of the Executive Council. He is led by his good example and always with good humor. In fact, his sense of humor is his secret weapon. He knows that union work is serious business, but it can also be a lot of fun. From dressing up as Rocky to our Blues Brothers Act a few months ago back in Chicago, our members have seen Fred's humorous side. So in the spirit of fun, I'm not going to attempt to tell a joke nearly as bad as he did earlier. <laughs> but I do have one last bone to pick. So on occasion, I have heard Fred referred to as the first NALC president from the South, which seems right at first. Not one of our predecessors was from the South. Most came from all the great labor towns of America, New York, Detroit, Boston, and Philly, as you would expect. And Fred's home branch is Sarasota, Florida, so this claim seems to be true. But he's not really our first president from the South. He's a Yankee. <laughs> through and through, and by that I mean a New York Yankee. Despite being born in Queens, his adult life in Florida might have qualified him as NALC's first Southern president, but his refusal to shed his love for the hated New York Yankees makes that claim dubious at best. So brothers and sisters, I humbly present myself as the real first NALC president from the South. Born in Mississippi and a diehard fan of America's team, the Atlanta Braves. In any case, brothers and sisters, Fred really did make it fun for NALC officers and staff to come to work. We will all miss him very much. Thank you, Fred. My brother and my dear friend. I know you will always be here for us, and I'm sure I'll be able to rely on you for wisdom and advice as I take on my new responsibilities. And let me be the first to call you President Emeritus of the NALC, as I am certain that the first general resolution to be adopted by the delegates of the 2024 Boston Convention will be one to give you that well-earned title. So how about a letter carrier cheer for my mentors and my dear friends, former Vice President Lou Drass and future President Emeritus Fred Rolando. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Now let's turn to the major challenges facing our union in the months and years to come. We can begin by acknowledging that despite our best efforts, the working conditions for letter carriers in what we hope is post-pandemic America are as difficult as we've seen since the creation of the Postal Service in 1970. Over the past two rounds of collective bargaining, we've grappled with a staffing crisis that has progressively gotten worse. Massive turnover and staffing shortages, which are drivers of managerial abuse, excessive overtime, and unsafe working conditions were problems pre-pandemic, and COVID-19 only made them worse. We responded in two rounds of bargaining by significantly raising CCA pay, accelerating the transition to career status, and establishing a variety of initiatives designed to improve CCA working conditions and to reduce turnover. But our approaches have been met with limited success. In the last several months, we reached agreement with the Postal Service to move hundreds of installations around the country to an all-career model. This has resulted in some improved staffing in these locations, but it is not enough. 
We must phase out non-career employment in the city carrier craft and significantly raise starting pay to solve the staffing crisis. This is the goal we will take up in February when our next round of collective bargaining begins. But there are solutions that we need even before contract talks begin. That's because a wave of crime against letter carriers has taken hold across this country. Increasingly, our members work in fear because so many of our brothers and sisters are being attacked on American streets by violent criminals. Just a week ago Friday, we lost a member named Andre Cross in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Andre was shot and killed in a robbery while delivering mail. He was just 41 years old and had 18 years on the job. And he survived by his wife and four children. It's heartbreaking and it's appalling. Now, sadly, such robberies have become commonplace around the country. As most of you remember at our convention in Chicago, this was a huge topic of conversation. This violence against our members is unacceptable. It must be stopped. I ask that you join me in a moment of silence for our fallen brother Andre Cross and all our brothers and sisters that have lost their lives while doing their jobs. Thank you. Let us together make a commitment as a union to do all we can do to make it stop. Why is this violence happening? We all remember there was a time not too long ago that nobody would attack a letter carrier, an employee of the federal government. We're, so, we're admired members of every, every community, even in those communities that were ridden with crime. That has changed. We know that crime in general rose during the pandemic in this country, and that carriers have been targeted by thieves who attempt to steal our keys with the hope of stealing mail. Protecting our members is and must be our number one priority. In fact, in recent weeks, we have been working with Postal Management, the Postal Inspection Service, the Office of Inspector General to find ways to deter crime and violence against letter carriers. We have made it crystal clear to all that are charged with protecting postal employees, we need measures to protect our members now. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, we will seek lasting solutions to the staffing crisis when we begin bargaining for a new national agreement in February. Let me repeat what I also said earlier. This means moving towards an all-career workforce and significantly raising starting pay. We will also fight to protect and improve all of our members' standard of living. To achieve this goal, we'll seek general wage increases and fight to preserve our cost of living adjustments, which have provided significant, though partial, protection against the surge in inflation we've suffered over the last couple of years. Another major topic in negotiations will be the Postal Service's plans to restructure its delivery network and operations. We recognize that USPS is attempting to reorganize in response to a massive shift in the mail mix over the past two decades. In that time frame, letter volume is down 50% and package volumes are up 300%. And we know that our network of delivery facilities has been starved of investment. That means they're all really old. We welcome new investment. But the overall restructuring plan will only work if the NALC is part of the planning and execution of this effort. In this upcoming round of bargaining, we will demand to continue to have a seat at that table and increase our involvement to make sure we protect the interest and rights of the city letter carriers that we represent. As in the past, preparations for collective bargaining are well underway. 
As part of that process, we are also preparing for the possibility of binding interest arbitration should we fail to reach a negotiated settlement. In the last contract, we ended up reaching a voluntary agreement after we had started interest arbitration proceedings. No matter which way the contract talks go, I can assure you that the NALC will be ready to deploy all of its resources to achieve a fair contract for all of our members. As we bargain for better wages, we will continue to focus our legislative and political agendas in support of active and retired letter carriers. The 117th Congress was a huge success for NALC and our allies. After more than a dozen years of sustained effort, we finally got Congress to enact postal reform legislation that both repealed the crushing pre-funding mandate and made six-day delivery a permanent part of the law. We also made significant progress on building support for other key legislation, notably the Social Security Fairness Act to repeal the WEP and GPO provisions that discriminate against our CSRS retirees. That bill, which will be reintroduced in the next Congress, gained the support of a bipartisan majority in the House of Representatives. The task now, however, is to replicate that success in the U.S. Senate, a challenge we will seek to meet in the 118th Congress. At the same time, we will fight to improve future pensions by passing the Federal Retirement Fairness Act, which would allow former TEs and CCAs to buy pension credit for their non-career service. We will also pursue new ways to strengthen the Postal Service on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. In Congress, we will work on new ways to financially strengthen the service, such as permitting them to better invest it's hundreds of billions of dollars in CSRS and FERS pension assets. Under the current law, we are forced to invest those funds in low interest government bonds, allowing a more sensible but safe investment policy to invest in private securities would generate billions in savings for the Postal Service. That will reduce the cost of these pensions for both us and the agency. It's not a new idea but it is one that needs to be executed with bipartisanship and precision to provide the greatest impact. At the same time, we will continue to press the Biden administration to take executive action to implement the recommendations of the Siegel Report, a 2012 Postal Regulatory Commission report that called on the Office of Personnel Management to accurately and fairly value the Postal Service's pension assets and liabilities. This would save the Postal Service billions annually, and we will urge the White House to explore initiatives by other federal agencies that could better use the Postal Service to achieve their missions, providing jobs and revenue to postal workers while improving government services to America's households and businesses. Our recent success on the legislative front is hinged on our ability to work with legislators in both parties and a broad coalition of allies to allow us to take advantage of the public's overwhelming support for the Postal Service. This ability will be central to our success in the future. The just concluded midterm election did narrowly shift control of the House of Representatives to the Republican Party, but the outlook for bipartisan support for the Postal Service remains positive. However, as we have seen in the past, a divided Congress can often lead to budget fights that threaten the health benefits and pensions of federal workers. We must, and we will, fight any misguided efforts to target federal and postal employees or our retirees for unfair cuts. <laughs> Another source of our success has been the strength of our political organizing and fundraising for the Letter Carrier Political Fund. The money we raise to support pro-letter carrier candidates in both parties and to finance extensive get-out-the-vote efforts with our allies in the AFL-CIO is essential to making our voice heard in Washington. In the recently concluded midterm elections, we supported hundreds of candidates from both parties who showed support for our issues. Amazingly, 95% of the candidates we supported won their races, including 84%
of challengers, an astounding number. In the years ahead, we aim to build on the recent success of the Letter Carrier Political Fund. We will aggressively work to educate all NALC members on the importance of contributing to the PAC. Now, I know our members always do the right thing, and I'm convinced that we have an opportunity to rapidly grow our PAC through that education. This will allow us to amplify and expand our influence on debates that affect wages and benefits and working conditions of letter carriers, as well as the health of the Postal Service. It will also allow us to fight for other important legislation, including the PRO Act, and other labor law reforms, as well as the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to expand vote by mail and strengthen American democracy. Both these bills are essential to improve the ability of unions to grow and to raise standards of living for all workers across America. They are also essential for the pursuit of economic and racial justice. We will complement our pro-labor efforts in Congress with continued engagement, cooperation, and solidarity actions with the broader labor movement. Of course, this starts with the U.S. Postal Unions, but also involves working with our allies in both our domestic and international federations. The AFL-CIO and UniPost and Logistics. These bodies provide platforms to improve labor conditions universally. For example, NALC works with both federations to help workers employed by Amazon to organize nationally as well as internationally. We cannot and we must not let Amazon's delivery operations set the labor market standards for our industry. Its non-union and therefore powerless and low-paid delivery workforce is a threat to every member of the NALC. Another priority I want to highlight for the coming years is to build on the progress we've made in expanding the networks of NALC representation available to city letter carriers. These networks, which include regional workers' compensation assistance, regional grievance assistance, legislative and political organizers, full-time arbitration advocates, in addition to the REAs um, that we have in each region, in my view, are among President Rolando's greatest accomplishments. My administration will grow and strengthen these networks. We will embrace new technology to give our representatives the tools they need to better serve our members and to educate our members about all the ways that NALC can help improve their working lives. We will also use technology to develop online learning and training programs to supplement our extensive in-person training capacity. Robust training is the key to arming all of our representatives with the knowledge and skills they need to best represent our members. We are committed to using all available tools to provide that education to those that have stepped up to represent letter carriers. Expanding and improving the representation we provide is the best way to maintain, perhaps even improve, on our organizing success. 93% of all active city letter carriers are members of the NALC, and we intend to remain the best organized open shop union in this country. A final priority I want to mention for years to come, for the years to come, is our commit, continued commitment to defend the Postal Service itself as a public service with affordable service for Americans, no matter where they live or how much money they have. As a union, we've always embraced a dual mandate, to fight for our members and for the public interest in a public post office. NALC and the other postal unions have been battling for decades against privatization and deregulation with great success, and we will continue to do that in the future. In a few short years, we will mark the 250th anniversary of the U.S. Post Office. We'll celebrate many events throughout history, such as Ben Franklin's post office that delivered the Federalist Papers that helped create the United States Constitution. Montgomery Blair's post office 
that created city delivery in 1863 and helped reelect Abraham Lincoln in 1864 with an innovation called absentee voting, one that allowed hundreds of thousands of Union soldiers to vote from the battlefields of the Civil War. John Wanamaker's post office that helped create a continental market economy with the invention of parcel post and mail order catalogs. And yes, Louis DeJoy's postal service that helped America survive the COVID-19 pandemic by delivering essential goods to every American household and facilitating the highest turnout election since 1900, thanks to vote by mail. No matter who leads the Postal Service, no matter how visionary or misguided they may be, NALC will be there to defend that great American institution. We will do that not only because it's in the best interest of our members, but also because it supports the common good for all Americans. I started this speech with a note of gratitude, and let me finish with a similar note by thanking the most important people in our union, the members we represent. They have been the key to our success for 133 years. There is nothing more powerful in America than empowered solidarity, and we have the full force of empowered solidarity in the NALC, thanks to the unity and commitment of our 285,000 members. For that, I am eternally grateful. I am also tremendously thankful for the NALC, our union. In many ways, it has given my life meaning and purpose, as I'm sure it's done for all of you in this room. Every day, NALC makes it possible to go to work and fight for the dignity and rights of our members who deliver the mail and for the dignity and security of the hard-earned benefits of our retired members who serve this country so well, even while they built and improved a powerful union. Every day, NALC gives us a platform to fight for racial and economic justice in the workplace, not just for letter carriers, but for all postal workers and all workers here and abroad. Every day, NALC gives us the capacity to join forces to protect one of America's greatest institutions, the United States Postal Service, a part of the social fabric in every community and an indispensable element of our economy and our democracy. And last but not least, every day, NALC makes it possible for men and women of every race and ethnicity from every corner of a gigantic country to embrace the power of solidarity and to fight for each other and to fight for the common good. For all of these reasons and many, many more, I am honored to be the 19th president of the National Association of Letter Carriers. Thank you all very much.